All right, everyone, I am here with Cha Zhang. Cha is a partner engineering manager at Microsoft Cloud and AI. Cha, welcome to the Twimble AI podcast. Thank you, Sam. Uh, I'm really looking forward to our conversation. Uh, before we dive into uh, the heart of it, let's get a little bit. Actually, I'm gonna I'm gonna start over if you don't mind. Uh, we won't be doing much of this, but just so you know, if you at any point need to kind of pause or restate something, that's fine because we will edit yeah. that out in the back end. Okay, cool. Thanks. All right, everyone, I am here with Cha Zhang. Cha is a partner engineering manager with Microsoft Cloud and AI. Cha, welcome to the Twimble AI podcast. Thank you, Sam. Nice to meet you. Great to meet you as well. Uh, before we dive in, I'd love to learn a little bit about your background. Tell us uh, how you came to work in computer vision. Sure, sure. Um, I actually have been at Microsoft for 16 years. Um, I joined Microsoft originally as a researcher at Microsoft Research. Uh, I was there for 12 years. My research was primarily applying machine learning to image, audio, video, all these uh, different applications. Um, started uh, uh, 2016, I joined on um, the product side and uh, currently I'm working uh, as a engineering manager and my primary focus is on OCR and uh, um, document understanding. Awesome, awesome. Uh, so we will be focusing in quite a bit on OCR and, and some of your work in that space. And, you know, I think people often think of OCR as a, you know, a solve problem, right? It's, you know, we've been right. scanning documents and extracting text out of those documents for uh, a long time. Obviously, uh, the advent of deep learning, you know, changes things, but I'd love to get the conversation started by having you share a little bit about what you know what's new and interesting in the in the space. How has it changed over the past few years? Sure. Actually, it wasn't very long ago when people talk about OCR. You know, what comes out the mind was firstly scan documents. Uh, mm -hmm. In many people's eyes, OCR for scan documents is sort of a solve the problem. Um, more lately, I think there's two major development. One is uh, with a mobile first kind of world where everybody now uh, have you know, mobile phones and they take pictures everywhere. So there's a lot of demand to do uh, text recognition out of images in the wild. And that certainly is a much more challenging problem than scan documents. Um, and then technically, uh, because of the advance in deep learning, uh, we have realized that with deep learning, uh, we can do OCR at a, a different level. We can make it a lot more accurate than before, and we can solve OCR problem in uh, the kind of image in the wild scenario. And so um, I think it started in 2000, early 2010-ish. I think there's a, a lot of big advent, uh, advances in this area, and now we're seeing basically ocr becomes something really works you know uh, people just don't need to worry about uh, quality etc it just mostly works mm -hmm. can you talk a little bit more about the the challenges that arise when you're trying to do ocr in the wild of course um so um, I think for documents usually it's white background and black text um, but uh, for images in the wild, essentially, it's, it's a photo. So um, in a photo, there's a lot of variations uh, in the text. Um, uh, first, there's a huge uh, scale variation. Uh, so some text, if you, if you capture a picture um, of a street, there might be some store name that are super big. And then there are some tiny text that's hard to see. So there's a big variation in scale of the text. Um, and uh, the aspect ratio of these texts uh, can be uh, really long because uh, text string can be very long uh, compared to regular objects like a cat or a dog. Uh, and uh, 
And because of the mobile capture scenario, usually it's difficult to enclose these texts by an axis aligned rectangles. Um, for example, you know, the, there might be perspective distortions of uh, the text uh, when the camera sees them. Uh, and then, you know, um, the background in the image in the wild is much more complicated than the typical white background you see in scan documents. Uh, and some of these backgrounds, such as fences, um, bricks, and stripes, uh, even though they appear quite simple for human beings, uh, but think of like fences can be a perfect uh, bunch of ones, you know, on the street sitting there, and they look very similar to to, to characters. And so mm -hmm. those create additional challenges. Um, and I think one of the biggest one, I think technically uh, for OCR that's challenging is the localization accuracy. And so typically in object detection, the localization accuracy if uh, is measured by intersection of a union. Uh, and if that criterion is bigger than 0.5, people think this is good enough. Uh, but uh, for OCR, um, if you actually, the intersection is only half of the union, uh, a lot of the characters will be missing. So uh, usually OCR will need a 0 0.5, 0 0.9, 0 0.95 level kind of accuracy in order to recognize all the characters uh, properly. So, Can you explain um, that are, in, in more detail? What is intersection over union and how is that used in sure, sure. object detection? Yeah, so, um, so in order to measure the accuracy of a particular uh, detection algorithm, uh, you need to ground choose label the data. And so typically mm -hmm. what people do is they create a bounding box of the object to be, deter to be detected. Uh, and then you use a automatic algorithm to figure out where the object is. And that will also create a bounding box. Now you have two bounding boxes. Uh, and uh, the, the question is how do you measure uh, how well these two boxes align. And uh, a common measure is to take the intersection of these two bounding boxes. Um, and uh, you take the union of these two bounding boxes and you get two areas. And you can imagine if the two bounding boxes are very close to each other, uh, overlapping a lot, then that intersection of a union would be very high. Uh, but if they are off, they are offset by quite a bit. Then you know that number is low. So that's kind of a um, academia standard how people um, measure detection accuracy uh, with this uh, criteria. Got it. And so the you were saying that the threshold that you need in the case of text is much lower. You were saying much higher, 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 much, much, higher. higher. Said point much nine. higher. Yeah, much higher. Much higher, much uh, higher. And so the um, so the the threshold is higher because of what? Um, because uh, um, let's just think about you know you have a ground choose text. Let's say uh, hello word, and uh, it's, mm -hmm. it's it's elongated a rectangle, and uh, you say I have a text detection algorithm. Uh, that cr creates a, also a bounding box, but uh, have a intersection of a union, let's say roughly 0.5. And so what that means is that the intersection area divided by the union of the two bounding box is 50%. Mm -hmm. um, so very likely uh, the detected bounding box will miss a few characters because you know the overlapping is not there. And so yeah. you might be missing an H, you might be missing a D at the end. Uh, and all this will cause the OCR to produce wrong results. And so that's that's the main mm -hmm. uh, challenge here. So in the case of a traditional um, object detection scenario, you know, you may miss a half of the face, but you can tell that there's a face there. Uh, yes. In the yes. case of uh, OCR, you're just missing letters and it makes it a lot more difficult for the, the algorithm to, to guess what was there. That's exactly. Got it. Um, and maybe taking a, a step back just to the, the problem as a whole, the, you know, what, what's granted mobile is driving the, you know, this um, transition to these in the wild, um, 
you know, these in the wild uh, pictures and, and people trying to OCR them. But what what are the are there what are the high value use cases there? Like, is it, you know, I'm thinking of some interesting ones as like the, you know, the, when it's in conjunction with translation, you know, maybe I'm in another country and I'm, oh, I've done this. Yes. You know, you take pictures of, of words in another character to try to read the menu or something like that. Um, yes. uh, and I've also done things like, you know, scan documents on a phone and, and you might want to OCR those, but those are, that's kind of back to the traditional OCR problem in a lot of ways. What, what, mm -hmm. what are some of the other use cases that are common? Yeah, so um, if, if you look at this kind of business opportunities, I, I still think the traditional document, you know, scan document, uh, I think uh, uh, some traditional kind of OCR problems are like, for example, receipts where people can scan in the old days, but nowadays people mostly do reimburse them by taking a, snapping a photo. So mm -hmm. um, I think in terms of the, the market, the revenue, I think that's still quite a big one. Um, there are a few others. Um, the one that you mentioned, uh, if you have a phone, you go to a foreign country, you snap a photo and you want to translate and that's the one. There's also a lot of um, uh, applications in digital asset management. And so this is when you either you are a big company or you are a personal kind of, uh, you have some big uh, storage of photos and where you want to organize these photos. Um, we have shown that um, you know with OCR capability, you can increase the accuracy of processing these photos and retrieve these photos. Um, uh, as a matter of fact, um, you know the big search engines like Google and Bing, uh, when they search images, uh, OCR is an integral part of uh, of that as well because uh, the, the OCR the content can help a lot in, in getting the best images. Okay, got it. Uh, and so you were you were mentioning kind of some of the the technical challenges and localization of the text in these images is one of those challenges. How do you how do you go about it? Is it right. uh, the case that you know? deep learning is, you know, so powerful off the shelf, you know, deep learning <laughs> techniques just solves it for you? Or uh, do you, you know, are you re-engineering the, the whole pipeline? How do you, do you approach that? Yeah. Um, so in uh, in text detection, uh, usually the, the detection pipeline is different from a traditional object detection. Um, uh, what's been most popular for kind of OCR for image in the wild today is uh, something called anchor-free um, um, detection. Uh, anchor so free. the idea, anchor-free. Um, so um, in uh, typical object detection, um, usually um, the, the most well-known algorithms like fast RCN and faster RCN, etc. Mm -hmm. They basically create these anchors and then they regress the actual bounding box of the objects. Uh, the challenge of using that kind of approach is that these anchors need to be preset. And so typically for normal object detection, you set at a certain um, density and then you set a, a certain set of aspect ratios. Like your, your anchor box are one to two, one to three, one to one. Uh, typically, you go about there, uh, but text, uh, some of the tech can go like 20 to 1. So really, you cannot, it will be a huge computational cost to go with anchor-based approach. And so mm -hmm. modern days for OCR, we go anchor-free. Um, and the high-level concept is essentially um, by using convolutional neural networks, uh, you almost do kind of a per pixel level uh, decision or classification saying, well, this region nearby this particular pixel looks like part of text. And so there is a text, non-text classification, almost kind of per pixel level. Mm -hmm. uh, and then you rely on um, a few algorithms to group these into text lines. Um, um, by looking at how well to, for example, to text region are similar to each other and you can decide, well, 
these two looks like the same texture, same color, maybe they should be connected. Um, and in this regard, there are quite a few um, well-known algorithms to do this connection. Earlier days, people use a relatively kind of a rule-based approach like SegLink, where they link um, based on some features, uh, but it's kind of rule-based. Uh, more recently, people start looking to new networks like relation network. Um, so they are kind of estimating the relation of two uh, regions of features. Um, and uh, based on that, to decide, well, these two should be connected or not. And so that way, um, you started kind of bottom up. You start with a per pixel kind of classification, and then you do grouping, and you come out with text lines. Um, very powerful approach. It can not only detect kind of uh, straight lines, but even curved lines. You can handle them pretty well with, with those approaches. Mm -hmm. um, and so it sounds like you're describing a, a pipeline that's not like a, a, you know end to end trained single mm, neural yeah. network that um, right. you give it images and, and train it on you know label data and it is um you know telling you what the the text is but rather a bunch of independent steps yes uh that's a very good observation um actually um so for ocr um detection is only the first step and after mm -hmm. detection uh, we typically run a character model where you take the detected text lines you normalize them into a straight line with a fixed height, and then you run a character model to actually decode the um, the image into a character, uh, a list of characters. Uh, and there are uh, a lot of the approach uh, actually similar to speech, uh, where you know speech is going from acoustic signal to uh, these texts, but here we're going from image to text. But uh, a lot of the approaches that we use, like LSTM. Uh, language modeling, these are very similar. Uh, now, your question is certainly valid because in speech today, you know, uh, people do end-to-end -end training. You start from audio signal, you directly go to text. Um, for OCR, we are not there year, uh, yet. Um, I think the main challenge is, well, first is like how much data you have. I think speech, you can collect a lot more data compared with OCR. OCR data are usually very expensive to collect in the label. And so um, going stage by stage at this point is more economically uh, doable than you know, do end-to-end -end training. Um, and, and why is that? It seems like we have tons of you know, pictures with words in them that we, um, you know, that we know. Particularly, uh, is, it, is it just of the in the wild? Uh, the in the wild examples where we don't have the label data, or is it also this document use cases? Because I'm imagining, you know, Microsoft has probably you know labeled a ton of receipts and business cards and that kind of thing. Yeah, um, I think certainly labeling is very very expensive, um, and for Microsoft, we are a company paying a lot of attention to privacy, you know, um, those kind of issues. And mm -hmm. the collecting OCR data has been a major um, kind of, I would say, um, a blocking issue to, to, to go for this kind of end-to-end -end approach. Because uh, if you think about it, a lot of the document that we actually care, like if you say, talk about invoice, talk about receipts, business card, they all contain PI information. Mm -hmm. uh, and those are data extremely difficult to obtain and uh, we follow very strict kind of guidelines how we can collect them how we can label them um, so in some way we are limited by these privacy uh, restrictions but um, we do respect those a lot and so um, we uh, as a result you know we are now going end to end at this point got it got it um makes me think a little bit about the some of the issues with neural networks remembering data so for example mm. there are examples where you you train a, uh, a, a you know CNN and there are some attacks that you can do that will reproduce some of the images you know it, to some degree or another that that mm -hmm. the um, 
the model was trained on. Likewise, with these very large language models, you can start to see some of the text that the the models were trained on come out in the in the output. Um, yes. I would imagine if you were training end to end, at least, then that becomes an issue as well, and and maybe you know more so than in the case of images. What what would you, what's your intuition there? Would it be worse or or better than images? I would imagine it will be um, similar, I would say. Um, so uh, after all, you know, uh, OCR, you come from image to text, but during the learning of this OCR process, uh, language model is actually very helpful to help improve the OCR accuracy. And so, uh, for example, during decoding of these text lines into uh, text, um, we use uh, some of the uh, like LSTM or you know basically these very popular um, uh, language modeling uh, schemes and uh, certainly it remembers the contextual information of the language in order to help the OCR to recognize these texts properly. And so um, I think when you go to end to end. Uh, when the amount of data they use for training is humongous. Um, I, I think, uh, you know, it's, it's difficult to imagine for me, you know, uh, we'll have similar level of data for training like BERT models or, you know, those mm -hmm. uh, GBT models. Those are huge, huge amount of data, but uh, still you will learn something uh, from the text and mm -hmm. they might leak into the model as well. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Uh, along those lines, what enabled BERT and uh, many of the recent innovations around language models is a, a shift from supervised to the semi-supervised mm -hmm. way yeah. of framing the task. Is there a semi-supervised framing for the OCR task that makes sense? Um, the actually for OCR today we are not. Uh, although I think it's it's definitely a very interesting research problem. Um, I think uh, um, Bird is a super nice framework for transfer learning. You know, you you go from pre-trained model and then you know unsupervised, and you you can. Um, in the image world, I think uh, transfer learning probably exists earlier in image than language. Uh, so earlier days when we have image net, we train like ResNet, those are already being used by uh, for transfer learning. Um, so uh, unsupervised kind of image learning is also, I think it's, it's still ongoing. There's a, mm -hmm. a lot of uh, um, interesting projects uh, going on. Um, yeah, I think uh, um, for OCR right now, we're not there yet. Um, I guess uh, one of the main uh, issues for building a product like OCR to use some of these pre-trained models is the computational cost. And I think this happens in language as well. Uh, or BERT model, the GPT model three, like this, you know, multi-billions of, you know, parameters, it's very difficult mm -hmm. to turn them into a product. Uh, for OCR, it's also, you know, we have the same problem. Computational cost is is uh, very sensitive. We need to make it fast. And so we're using relatively small models. And normally we train from scratch. Um, transfer learning does show some benefit, but when the data reaches a certain amount, we found training from scratch is perfectly fine. Yeah. Meaning when, when you have a certain amount of data to train from? Then, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, and when you have, sorry, go ahead. Um, we are in the in the very early days when we started doing deep learning on OCR. We actually rely a lot on trans uh, on distillation. That's teacher student learning, where we first train a big model and then we gradually uh, use teacher student learning to to create a small model so that it can run efficiently. Uh, nowadays, I we have figured out that you know you can train these small models from scratch. Um, uh, the, the amount of data that we have on the order of you know um, hundreds of thousands and millions of images uh, it's sufficient to train from scratch on small model and reach about the same accuracy. Can you elaborate a little bit on that? The do you are you saying that you need more data to train smaller models? 
Um, no, I'm saying that, um, so take BERT as an example. BERT is super beneficial for translate for learning because it has seen so many documents. So giving any new language task, um, presumably your data is not much. There's not much data um, that you have to train this new task. Uh, and therefore leveraging BERT where it has seen so many documents will help uh, through transfer learning to transfer some of the knowledge that the bird has learned from this huge set of documents to the small kind of task. And so that it can reduce the amount of uh, documents required to train the, the smaller task. Uh, the same thing happens in ImageNet transfer learning where, you know, if it's a ResNet train on ImageNet, uh, you learn a lot of visual information from the ImageNet data set. Uh, then if you have a tiny uh, detection task, like detecting a um, helmet, let's say, um, and you can, you can do the transfer learning and you can use a very small amount of data set uh, to actually train a very good helmet uh, detector. Uh, what I'm saying, what I was saying just now was that for the problem of OCR where, you know, it is certainly a very important computer vision problem and, uh, you know, every company who invests in OCR tend to collect quite a bit of data, not to the level of, you know, uh, billions, but, you know, uh, hundreds of thousands, like millions. Uh, to that level, uh, that amount of data is sufficient uh, that you do not need to go transfer learning. You can train the model from scratch and you get very good uh, result. Got it, got it, got yeah. it. Uh, and so the when you were using transfer learning, were you using uh, models based on ImageNet, you know, along the lines of ResNets and, uh, and others or were yeah. there? Yeah. Okay, got it. Yeah. Um, and so you're, uh, let's see. So the the smaller models that you're training are they the you know some of the traditional architectures that we've already you know brought up, or are you building out new architectures for the models themselves for for this specific problem? Um, right now, we're using some of the traditional models. Um, there are some active research going on uh, regarding searching the best effective architecture for OCR. Um, we, are, we haven't seen convincing results yet, but I think that's a very active research area that uh, we're still kind of looking into, particularly when, when we're trying to make it smaller and smaller, you know, yeah. faster and faster. Yeah. And when you say searching the best architecture for OCR, are you, are you speaking using this, the word searching generally? Like you, you have researchers are looking at different models and trying to find the best one for OCR. Or are you suggesting a domain specific neural architecture search kind of? I mean, neural architecture search. Okay. Uh, yeah. So that certainly can be uh, applied to OCR. And I, okay. uh, we, we're still exploring it, but I think it's a very promising direction. Okay, interesting, interesting. Uh, earlier in the conversation, you talked about the one of the the big use cases is some of this semi-structured uh, data that um, we want to extract information out of. Uh, invoices yeah. uh, is one example. Uh, there was a recent uh demonstration or i guess it's actually product now of the mobile version of excel or something you can take a picture of a, mm -hmm. a, a grid grid like data and that will um you know both extract the text and organize it into a, a spreadsheet yes. you know, talk a little yes. bit about um the product that you're working on the form recognizer uh which is doing something similar yeah, of course. Um, so, um, so OCR certainly is pretty low level, and uh, it's uh, you know other than some of the application I mentioned earlier, like digital asset management, photo management, you know, translation, you can directly use OCR. But uh, for many customers, um, what they want is not just OCR; they want to extract information from documents. Um, think about, you know, I, I'm, I need to process millions of invoices. I want to extract vendor name, you know, due date, total amount. 
uh, or if it's an MS expense system where you want to um, process all the receipts and, uh, you know, either it can be a verification purpose, for example, like, okay, how do I make sure um, employees are not putting random numbers uh, and they, they don't match with the, the receipt that's actually uh, filed? Uh, you know, it's, it's actually, it sounds kind of silly, but in the, you know, today, a lot of the company do this verification manually. Um, so um, because of the huge manual amount of effort needed, they often can only do sampling. So you, you sample like 5% of these receipts to validate, but uh, you kind of miss a huge chunk uh, that you never even look at it. So, um, so we are looking at this space and we're trying to build uh, essentially two category of product. One is a pre-built set of product. And so these are solutions that works out of the box. Um, for example, uh, it can be a pre-built receipt, pre-built uh, business card, pre-built invoice. And so these are, uh, you s basically you're sending a image or PDF file, it will extract all the fields that you're in you'll be interested in. Uh, another big category that we think are super important is uh, customization because, you know, the pre-build may never fit every need. Um, so we have a solution called the custom form where we allow customer to uh, basically send us a few sample images. Um, you can either label or even, you know, not doing any labeling. Um, but uh, we will be able to extract key value pairs uh, out of these documents. Um, again, we see this as a uh, much closer to what the customers need, and that's what um, the form recognizes its position as. Mm -hmm. So we've talked about a bunch of the interesting technical challenges at, at the lower level at, at OCR. Does right. the form level you know, is that a kind of a packaging of uh, of OCR? Or does it have its own uh, technical challenges to overcome? Actually, it has a lot of very interesting challenges. Um, so, um, one of the work uh, recently is coming out of from uh, Microsoft Research uh, was, uh, you know, targeting exactly this problem, and so. For just think about it, uh, it, you know, the language, I mean, passing these invoices and receipts are essentially sort of a language problem because, you know, you have this text there. Uh, the, the challenge here is that these, um, these are images, so you run OCR on them, but um, unlike a typical language uh, data set where you, you scratch from, uh, say, internet, you know, Wikipedia, there's, you know, you basically have this. Um, ordering of these words already, but uh, if these data are coming from an image, uh, essentially you can detect these text lines, but uh, it's actually very difficult to define the read order of these text lines. And ordering of these text lines by itself is a very challenging problem when you have uh, images in the wild. Paper can be curved, you know, can be crunched, can can be rotated, perspective, you know, all kind of issues. It can have background text, you know, all this. And so um, the particular approach that MSRA came out is called Layout LM. It's a, um, it's actually a modified BERT model. It's also a language model, but in addition to the language, we also embed uh, 2D information, like what is the X, Y position of the uh, bounding box of the text? Um, so mm -hmm. with that information uh, trained, actually this is all can also be trained without supervision, it's so unsupervised pre-training. Uh, we're able to learn this kind of spatial relationship in these invoices without coming out with explicit read order. Um, and uh, uh, with that, we actually can um, do a lot of this key value extraction really well. Um, and there's also uh, quite a lot of um, advanced research looking into, say, relation networks, where you see two text lines nearby each other. You can predict the relationship. Again, this is similar to uh, the OCR where you have these bottom pixel level classification, you want to group them here, you, you mm -hmm. want to group key, key and value pairs. 
Um, and there's also uh, a lot of advanced research in these graphical convolution networks where you do convolution networks over a graph, where the graph is defined by connecting nearby text lines. Again, this is approach without requiring read order, but just look at the spatial relationship. And so these are all actually very exciting kind of extension of language, yeah. but also using uh, visual uh, information to help uh, passing these uh, vertical data more accurately um, than Interesting. before. Yeah, it, I think it's, you know, I, I, I at a quick, uh, you know, quick thought would have imagined that, you know, maybe the top part of the the stack there was more rule based and the bottom part mm. of the stack was you know more machine learning based but it sounds like they're even uh i don't know you know relatively but there are a bunch of really interesting we're uh, doing a lot of problems machine learning stuff the, on the top, the top as well as so, well yeah. yes. and i'm imagining the you know when you talk about relation that for example uh on an invoice you could have you know date and then the date you know, horizontally next to it, or you can have date and then a date beneath it. Yes. Um, you may have a, a, an address box and then a, a bunch of text that comes beneath it. And it would be nice to know that, you know, we're talking about the address here. That's that's part of the that's idea right. of that's a structured right. text extraction. Mm -hmm. um, so in that you mentioned relation net and graphical CNNs, are those two approaches to solving the same problem or are they solving different aspects of the problem? Um, they solve different aspects of the problem, uh, and they can be also used to solve the same. I mean, like right now, the, the main focus uh, for us, for example, are extracting key value pairs. And mm -hmm. this is both, both kind of pre-build and uh, uh, customization. Uh, think about, you know, if it's an invoice and you want a vendor name. Um, so, um, and... Uh, it's a name. Uh, certainly, you know uh, the text information because you know you see this is it looks like a vendor name. This probably is a vendor name. You know, some invoice doesn't even have the key in the invoice. Right. Like you don't even have the word vendor name there. Right. So how do you right. figure out this thing is still a vendor name? So, so there um, you rely on information that's language and uh, that's also kind of the how the documents laid out like okay the font size may matter you know the position of this thing may matter um so we are looking into combining all these informations to 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 come out with a better decision on, on those uh, fields mm -hmm. and, and so how does a graphical representation or a way of thinking about the document get you to a, a solution to you know these kinds of problems you know for example the unlabeled vendor name yeah, so um, so the the graphical kind of approach um, uh, is basically um, so you get a bunch of text lines detected by the OCR and you connect these text lines with their neighbors, um, and uh, um, you define basically how strong these connections are. Um, Actually, it's not defined. You actually learn these relationships by looking at the text, looking at their relative positions, like looking at their font similarity. Like one one issue that you actually just mentioned was like addresses. You can actually have multiple lines of addresses. How do you know they actually belong to the same address, right? So there's this kind of all these uh, side information could be very helpful in determining that they should be grouped together. Um, um, and uh, in the convolutional kind of graphical model, um, you you learn a convolutional network by computing from all the neighboring um, nodes, where each node is a text line, um, to aggregate basically at the center node. And so basically, the model learns um, by not only looking at the current um, um, text line that's in focus, but also look at all the nearby text lines and decide, well, given all these contextual information, it does look like this is the vendor name. Um, I guess that's a very high level conceptual description of why it would work, um, mm -hmm. but uh, um, 
it's 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 a it's a data driven machine learning so the, the model learns mm -hmm. learns learns those things yeah as you're solving problems like this are you often needing to relabel your data set for example i'm imagining you know early on in developing an algorithm like this you you have a bunch of invoices and you you know draw a bounding box around the addresses and you say this is the address mm -hmm. but then you say oh well the font information you know is a whole new data set you know so yeah. then you have to label well this is you know are you going in and having people label helvetica versus ariel that seems a bit fine-grained and hard to actually no, um, get experts to label or is it more abstract than that um we usually only label the end goal which is the key value pair which is the fields that you're going to extract so for example you want to uh, extract a vendor name vendor address um total tax you know these you basically draw a bounding box in those regions and use that as the as a ground truth data Got it. now when so i say um yeah i think yeah. we're going to the we're going to the same place when you say font when i say font uh actually it's in in some way implicit in the sense that okay. we're taking these bounding boxes we extracting image information right so think of it as a, let's say run a convolution network to extract a, a feature of that part of the, the text region a text line um, so this feature is essentially all the visual information that can be helpful in deciding or determining the relationship between text lines um, and so if features are similar that probably mean they are similar font they are similar size you know so those okay. kind of uh, uh, so yeah, I think uh, th that seems to be efficient, if, uh, yeah, sufficient to to to, to okay. handle this. So yeah. you're not trying to, to kind of featureize your underlying images into these distinct things. Uh, no, which is what no. I what I inferred when you said font. But have you? Do you look at the? Um, you know, is there an, an analogy to? Kind of looking at the layers of the network and you know it, you know when we do this with cnn's you see like textures and things like that is there some analogy that you've seen and looking at the layers of you know the network that says oh this layer is like you know identifying fonts uh no we haven't been going there yet <laughs> okay <laughs> uh, i guess it's uh it's certainly interesting to look at it um I my my take is most likely you know font is just one attribute. I believe yeah. uh, there are many other things. Um, um, and and yeah, I think it'll be interesting to look at these uh, um, features visually. Yeah, mm -hmm. uh, we we've you know, talked throughout the, the the discussion about kind of the 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 ways that OCR and this form recognition problem kind of blends the the you know vision domain and NLP domain and you know language models ha has come up uh, quite a bit. Um, you know, is there a little bit more kind of depth we can go into there? Some of the ways that that you see NLP. Uh, uh, and, and in particular, the advances in, in NLP over the past few years kind of influencing the, the, the problem and the way you solve it? Yeah, um, we certainly see NLP um, plays a very important role in these verticals. Um, you know, after all, um, these uh, invoice receipt, um, business card, you know, these are all human artifacts they are kind of language artifacts in in some way right so um um and so all the kind of latest state of the art in language modeling we definitely want to leverage them um the, the thing i mentioned earlier like the layout or um it's it's one way to leverage them by uh using the language model but also embed additional visual information and hopefully to solve these problems uh, effectively uh because it's, it's input is really different right and, you know the bird is like you take text is input here we're taking a 
uh, a bunch of text lines with their 2D locations and bounding boxes as input, and uh, the, the algorithm can naturally kind of solve these problems. Um, yeah. mm -hmm. And is it also trying to do the traditional language model predicting the the next character or word or or you know set of text yeah the way we train them are are very similar basically you know mask text when right? you mask some words and trying to predict um, mm -hmm. um that's um certainly you can you can use a lot of others i think you know like uh, i know recently people use uh, translation uh targets you can use auto variation encoder kind of targets um and uh, you know this is a really active research area at this point. Um, I don't think I think we're still just scratching the surface. Although we're already seeing very very promising results, and so um, we definitely want to look deeper into this uh, and see how well um, this really can push the state of the art. Yeah. Mm -hmm. but kind of continuing on that thread of the you know active research areas and what the future holds in this area, you know, what are you most excited about in, in this domain of, you know, OCR and in general, you know, extracting text from documents, vertical applications uh, and the like? Yeah, I think, uh, um, you know, we have been working on this problem for quite a while, but I think uh, um, there's still a lot of interesting problems. Uh, and uh, only when we start to work with customers, we realize, you know, there are problems we haven't been able to solve. Um, I can just name one, uh, for example, like table extraction. Uh, it sounds trivial, but when you actually look at the all the existing tables uh, in the world, um, you know, the simplest one are those with explicit cell borders where you have straight lines. And uh, But in reality, these tables can have no cell boundaries at all. It can be mixed on top with stamps, you know, all these things that are kind of uh, making the problem extremely hard. And uh, um, so that's just, you know, another one that is extremely um, challenging, but we want to solve. Another thing that I um, sort of briefly mentioned about earlier was the customization part of these verticals. How do you customize uh, to customers' own data instead of you know having these pre-built? Because um, after you know, inevitably you will have data that doesn't work with these pre-built models. And how do you uh, allow customer to have a way to build their own models to um, to still work? And and that. Uh, by itself is a, it's a very challenging problem because, you know, asking customers to label a lot of data is, is painful. They don't want to go there. And so either we go unsupervised or we go with a very, very limited number of supervision data. And in such a case, how do we adapt our model so that it can work on these documents that customer realize that the pre-built model has failed? Uh, that's also a very interesting kind of research problem that we were looking into. It's like, it's, you know, in, in vision, in, in language, there's this low shot learning. It's, it's also, you know, now mm -hmm. it's definitely applicable to the, the problem here as well. Mm -hmm. uh, in, the, in the case of some of the, the productized vision offerings, um, you know, Azure does this as well. The the user is able to upload, you know, its own set of label data and kind of the results of, for object detection are kind of fine tuned against the, mm -hmm. the user's data set is, yeah. do the, the OCR and form recognition offerings, are they, are you providing something similar? Uh, like, yeah. can you upload, can I upload my own invoices and you're doing some kind of transfer learning or, or well, if you can't, if you are, what are you doing to take advantage so, of that, what the user is providing? So we do have a product called Custom Form, uh, which allow customer to upload a, a few samples here. We usually say minimum five samples. So mm -hmm. um, say you have an invoice that doesn't work with uh, existing models. And so you want to solve the problem, you upload five invoices with similar, it's kind of either from the same vendor or kind of looks or similar in structure. Um, and uh, we can figure out these key value pairs, we can extract them 
uh, either unsupervisedly or supervisedly. Right? So unsupervised means a uh, customer don't need to label anything. So you upload the five documents. Um, the information we're gaining by looking at these five documents is, well, these documents are supposed to be similar and therefore there are gonna be a bunch of words in this document that actually is common across these documents. So this commonality help us to tell, well, this is probably part of the empty form or the template of the form. While the thing that's varying across forms are like, uh, these are must be information customer has filled in uh, as kind of different from sample to sample. And so with that information, uh, we can actually extract uh, key value pairs out of, uh, without any supervision, all you need is upload five similar documents. Uh, of course, that works to a certain degree, but if you're still not happy with accuracy, uh, we provide a way for you to label uh, your key value pairs. And so here it's like we, we have a UX where you can go and uh, label the fields you care by essentially uh, highlight the OCR text lines where you know you think this is a value I want to extract, uh, and then we uh, we actually learn a model out of five samples and produce um, a model that can be used by the customer to extract these values. Um, the accuracy is actually normally pretty high uh, in the 90, 95 percentage range, actually. So. And so when the when the customer does this, is this process entirely learned or is there a, a human in the loop kind of exception handling element to it? Um, so I guess this is a probably kind of a, take a step back. I think all the products, OCR products today, you know, OCR has made a significant advance, but if if you um, if you actually care about uh, the numbers. Think about invoice, right? If you yeah. if your total is wrong, you know it's 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 really bad. Very bad. <laughs> so, uh, what we recommend is definitely we we recommend people to to have a agent um, kind of backup. Uh, and uh, for all the products we offer, so uh, we give people and if the... we give people confidence, right? Okay. So how confident we are about the extraction of a particular value. Uh, and uh, different customer can choose their own threshold and, uh, you know, and have a agent to look at them. But I think at this today's accuracy, uh, we, we don't recommend kind of straight through unless you are handling certain specific uh, applications. Uh, I can give you an example. For example, if you're, very, if you're verifying a receipt against, uh, like a receipt image against a employee entered data, Mm. So there you can go automatic, right? Because you, if the OCR produces a different number than the employee, well, you will need somebody to look at them anyway. But right. if they actually match, then, well, that, that probably means it's okay. So right. certain application you can, you can, you can automatic more. Um, Got it. Got it. Um, uh, and so in, in the question that I was asking is slightly different though. When you, you know, so say, you, you've got someone using automated form recognition and they have their five examples that they mm -hmm. haven't been happy with and they submit mm -hmm. that in through, you know, some website, our mm -hmm. API. Um, yeah. Is someone at Microsoft taking those and, you know, going, taking them manually through some process to try to figure out why they're not working or are they thrown into some training job and then the customer's result gets better? Ah, okay. No, uh, no, we don't look at customer's data. So this is a fully automated product, meaning, mm -hmm. you know, customer uh, basically label these files. Um, they call a API to train a model. And, uh, you know, the, the whole process is automated. Um, it's and is it's basically it, uh, algorithm. And so under the covers, you know, what's, are they, does, are they, kind of forking off their own model and the you know last few layers are getting cut cut off and it's fine tuning or is it more elaborate than that or uh it's it's more elab elaborative than that um underneath the hood there are um there are multiple steps um uh, we leverage a lot of information in these sample documents uh, for example you know as i mentioned earlier 
there will be words common across these samples, and uh, those are very strong indicators uh, regarding you know this might be part of the empty part of the form where you know you probably think these are not so interesting to the customer, um, and uh, the transfer learning is you know. Um, it, it's certainly one way of doing that. Um, we are right now. We are actually training these models without transfer learning. So it's actually the model is trained from scratch for every uh, very few uh, customers. Uh, oh, okay. We're able to do this. We're able to do this um, because uh, um, some very uh, interesting work that we have done to uh, basically uh, augment this data. To, to make sure that you have sufficient data to still be able to train a model out of you know five samples only and so um, and it's uh, uh, the, the this can be a, a feedback loop as well so you know if customers not happy with a model trained by five samples you can upload more and mm -hmm. we just train a new model for you so every time you retrain just get a new model. Um, that way, you know, it's a it's a feedback loop where customers can keep improving their model until it, to a certain stage where it's it's really uh, performing for the customer. And, and so, when you say aug augmenting the five that they're providing, are we talking about data augmentation in the sense of a transformation pipeline that kind of changes, you know? Uh, adds noise, rotates, that kind of thing? Or are we talking about you've got some other data set that you're adding to their five and training it on that aggregate data set and, uh, and that's how you're producing a better model? Um, both, although I think the latter one, <laughs> latter one is more uh, because okay. you know actually when customer label these data, they actually provide. We ask them to provide some additional information. For example, you know if they label this as a date, and we know it's a date, and so in this way we can artificially create more data uh, to fill the form so that we can produce um, more data to train the model. Also, we use a very robust machine learning algorithms that are robust to very few examples. And so um, that way um, we, uh, we, can, we can learn with this limitation. You know? mm -hmm. Normally, if you look at many of the um, other offerings that people provide, you, know, you have to train with hundreds of examples here. We're pushing it really down to five, and we hope to push even lower uh, in the future. Mm -hmm. And so does that mean that the so i'm assuming that this is a stacked problem and you've got you know some low level ocr for example models that are trained with many many documents and you know what we're what you're doing with the this uh form recognizer custom data is more at the top end of that stack um mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. uh, is the is the off the shelf model that I'm using uh, without the the five example customization is that also trained on relatively few examples? Um, what do you mean? I, I guess what I, I guess maybe I'll jump ahead to to the conclusion that I'm drawing. Or what's what's confusing <laughs> me is how how are you getting? good better results with few examples if you're not using any kind of transfer i, I guess i heard in your explanation that you're not right, using any kind right. of transfer right so um i guess um so right now the custom form support uh training model and these models are usually uh, each model is geared towards one particular form type and so in some way mm. you can think this problem is actually restricted it's it's actually a Got easier problem. Uh, it's not like a pre-built invoice where you essentially you want to handle all invoices. Here we are handling one particular invoice coming from, I, I would say, one particular vendor. Let's say right. Right. Like, right. Okay. So, so, so they the usually use a template. You know, it's like, Got it. And so the customer then, do they call a unique API 
to resolve invoices of this type or is that then ensembled and then there's something that decides whether it's of the type that you've built the new model mm. for? Yeah, so here's a kind of the recommendation uh, that we give to customers, right? So, um, so you maybe start with the pre-built model and uh, the, the pre-built model may work and then your job is done, you know, you're yeah. happy, you go. Uh, and then you you certainly let's say you have a lot of invoices and uh, out of a thousand ten of them doesn't work mm -hmm. and so what we offer the customers well you can take these invoices and you can train specific models for these 10 different invoices yeah you might need to train more than one model this uh, special model because these invoices may look very very different uh, so imagine you can train like 10 different custom models for this. Yep. Uh, we actually also offer um, kind of automatic uh, invoice classification. So um, a, a API called a model compose where we can compose these 10 small models into one. And so okay. all you need is just call into that one. Uh, and by calling into that one, we also provide you a confidence to say, well, because you know, during testing, uh, the customer send the invoicing. We don't really know whether it's one that doesn't work with this uh, pre-built one or whether it's uh, it's part of this. Uh, it works well with the pre-built. So, you send this invoice first to the customized version of the model, and we will tell you, hey, it doesn't look like any of the ten you have trained. And so, in this case, you will revert back and say, "Okay, now I'm calling the pre-built invoice because you sort of know that pre-built actually works well for that." Uh, so that's what we um, recommend customers to do. Uh, okay, today. interesting. Yeah, it's uh, I, I dug into a little bit of the the, the detail there, but it's interesting to see uh, kind of how the end to end problem is put together. And right. you know, in a case like this, the you know, the ends of that problem are, you know, on the customer side, not just the service that you're, that you're yes. offering. And yeah. so seeing how the, you know, how the pieces are, are put together is kind of interesting. Right. Um, awesome. Well, uh, Chad, thanks so much for taking the Thank time and walking us through, you know, some of the, the interesting that things that are happening in, in these domains. Thank you for having me. Great. Thank you. Thank you.